Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the African Philanthropy Forum, I would like to warmly welcome you to our 2017 annual conference. We are so excited to have you here. I'm excited because you're in Lagos, my city, and you're in Nigeria, our country. As many of you know, the African Philanthropy Forum is a network of social investors and philanthropists who are committed to sustainable and inclusive development on the continent. And so it is such a joy to see all of you gathered in this room today, and we're looking forward to engaging, learning, and sharing experiences over the next 48 hours. I'm personally looking forward to connecting with all of you, if I can, in the next hours. We have a fantastic lineup of activities. If you're not on WOVA, get on WOVA. Those on WOVA are having an amazing time already. Their conference began a week ago when we launched WOVA. So get on WOVA today. And to move straight into the conference, I would like to invite an amazing woman that I met about a year ago. And I've had the honor and pleasure to serve under her leadership in the past few months as we have worked to establish the African Philanthropy Forum as an independent entity on the African continent. Her commitment to the development of Africa is unwavering. Her tenacity is unbelievable. And for those of you who know her, you will agree with me that her passion is contagious. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly welcome the pioneer board chair of the African Philanthropy Forum, Mrs. Sisi Masiiwa. A very nice introduction, I must say. Thank you, Mosin. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Are you excited to be here this morning? Yes. Okay, tell your neighbor, I'm glad I came to this conference. <laughs> now, so you have two neighbors, you have to do it twice. <laughs> so I want to give you again a very, very warm welcome to our conference uh, 2017. Africa Philanthropy in a Changing Global Context is our theme for this year. I want to say thank you so much to those of you who have been attending our conferences in the previous years, and also welcome to those of you who are attending the conference for the very first time. Who has been in the last uh, uh, conferences we held in Rwanda, in, in Ethiopia, in Morocco? Yeah, give them a very warm clap. Thank you, welcome. And who's attending for the first time? Woo! <laughs> That's wonderful. I would also want to give a really warm welcome to and acknowledge the presence of Jane Wales, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Philanthropy Forum, uh, through whose vision, Jane, this is your vision. You created the APF. It, was, it is your baby. You gave birth to us, and we want to honor you and to say thank you so much for believing in this. Jane has a team, uh, Susie, who's not here, who's also been very actively involved in organizing previous conferences, and I want to also acknowledge the awesome and uh, passionate uh, work that Susie has contributed to getting us to where we are. I want to recognize a few people. Uh, I know everybody is important. All of you had to cancel something to prioritize coming to this event. But uh, for the sake of protocol, there's some people I need to recognize for their presence. First of all, uh, I want to recognize George Wenner, who's the Minister of Education and Chair of the Interministerial Scholarship Committee of the Government of Liberia. Uh, General Theophilus Dajuma, who is chairman of the T.Y. Dajuma Foundation. Queen Tandekile Njovu Zwelitini, uh, Queen of the Zulu uh, Kingdom of the Republic of South Africa. We recognize Her Royal Highness Queen Sylvia from Uganda. We also recognize Her Excellency Toyin Sar Saraki, who is the founder and president of the well, uh, Wellbeing Foundation Africa. We recognize Ambassador Stuart Symington, He's the U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria and former U.S. Special Representative. I also want to give a very big thank you to our supporters and our sponsors, which include 
uh, the Dangote Foundation. Thank you for your phenomenal contribution. Thank you so much to Owando Foundation, MTN Nigeria. We are grateful for your contribution. Thank you so much, Bill Campbell, the uh, Campbell Family Foundation, for your contribution. Thank you to the Global Philanthropy Forum, Jane. We are so grateful for what you've contributed to make this possible. And uh, there's another uh, foundation called High Life. <laughs> we also want to say thank you uh, to the support we've received from the media. Business Day Nigeria, you are awesome. We are grateful. Grateful to The Guardian Nigeria, Ebony Life TV, thank you, and Ventures Africa. We are so grateful. Uh, this is the first time we are holding the APF conference as an independent entity. And since the beginning of this year, we've established an office in Lagos, which is run by Mosun Layode, who you just met. Uh, she has, I know Mosun hasn't slept. Her energy is amazing. She got on the ground running, and the things that she's been able, able to achieve in a short space of time can only be done by somebody who really who's living her vision and her dreams, so thank you for that. We have a cohort of four board members. Uh, four uh, board members who include Her Royal Highness Queen Sylvia, uh, uh, Benga Oyabode, who is founder and chairman of Aluko and Oyabode, uh, a law firm who also been very uh, important in giving us um, the support we need, technical expertise to get the uh, organization registered and to get it going. Thank you so much. Ndidi was the founder of Leap Africa, co-founder of Ace Food Processing and Distribution. She's a former uh, director of uh, APF and also uh, she's part of Sahil Capital Partners and Advisory. Ndidi, your energy is contagious. So you think I'm contagious. I got it from Didi. Okay. <laughs> So we are excited also through the generosity of all the sponsors, but you know what excites me is uh, people paid to come to this conference. Uh, we received sponsorship and this conference is fully funded. I just want to do a quick run through uh, of the events that we've held in the last eight months uh, as uh, Mosun, uh, mentioned earlier, she joined on the 1st of, of April. And in that period, we've successfully held an APF learning session in Johannesburg, South Africa, which was attended by 170 philanthropists, entrepreneurs, and leaders from all over the continent. We successfully held a regional meeting in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, which was attended by 42 current and aspiring philanthropists. And recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had an afternoon tea with 55 Nigerian entrepreneurs, leaders, and philanthropists in Lagos leading up to this uh, conference. I just have a few remarks I would like to make, which I think, which I hope will lay the stage for the upcoming two days. I'd like to start with the good news. So depending on which part of the media you've been listening to, We've been hearing some good things that are happening, happening on the African continent, where the economies that are taking off, economies like Rwanda, uh, if you've been there, uh, you will be inspired. If you haven't been there, make sure you buy your ticket and make your way there to see what has happened in Rwanda in a short space of time. Uh, incredible stuff continues to happen in countries like Botswana, in your uh, countries like uh, Mozambique. I come from Zimbabwe, so we are in the wings, okay? We'll be on the list next year, I promise. <laughs> but three countries that really stand out, um, according to a World Bank uh, uh, Global Outlook Report 2017, uh, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire. Why do they stand out? They are growing right now at a rate of 8% and are forecasted to maintain that growth or surpass it for the next three years. And there are all sorts of factors that are driving the growth. I'll leave that to, to the economists uh, to talk about. However, in the midst of the above growth, Sub-Saharan Africa faces a number of challenges on its pathway to socioeconomic growth. And I want to highlight four pressure points. Number one, youth unemployment. According to a UNICEF uh, report, Generation 2030 Report uh, 2.0, I'll share with you what they say 2050 looks like. Number one, Africa's inhabitants will double from 1.2 billion in 2016 to 2.5 billion people. 
So one in every four people you meet anywhere will be African. I don't know whether we should clap or, <laughs> or look down in despair. <laughs> but I'm the ultimate optimist. We clap. 40% of the world's children under 18 will live in Africa. We are facing, so the question to ask is, are we facing the brutal facts? Just remember, without employment, the youth become your greatest security risk for any nation or continent. The second pressure point is traditional jobs have been disrupted by digitization, and the upcoming wave in technological advances like artificial intelligence and robotics raises a number of issues, including impact on future jobs. So to what extent are our, our, uh, our education systems and institutions on the African continent prepared to face these changes? To what extent are governments willing to respond to these changes with the right policies? Is the private sector weighing in with its own strategic input to confront the changes? The third pressure point, slow economic growth. Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP per capita at constant 2005 prices was $1,036 in 2014 at, and growing at 1.4%. If we maintain the growth, it will take 50 years to double the per capita to $2,072, nowhere near where Singapore was in 1965 or Jamaica in 1960. So I think this kind of like gives us a, a, a good reminder of why we are all gathered here, right? Then the fourth pressure point is the leadership and governance. We have, global lead, we have a global leadership crisis, but it's even more apparent on the continent. The tough questions we have to ask ourselves as leaders are, number one, do we have the vision to confront the crisis? Do we have the will to make the tough, division, uh, tough calls that are to make the tough uh, calls that are truly transformational? Do we have the resources to sustain the changes that need to be made? And are we willing to take the long-term view, even if it means foregoing short-term benefits? Now, do I have answers to these? I think there are possibilities and options I would like to put forward to you that we, I think would be great if we considered for the next two days. In the next few days, I would like us to think about the critical partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. The public sector being includes, here I've included donor agencies and, uh, and, and, and governments. And when I say private sector, I'm including businesses and philanthropists. I think it's important for the public and the private sector uh, partnerships uh, to, to drive the change. Partnership collaboration is key in driving changes. Governments can never solve all our problems. They were never meant to solve our problems, and they never will have the capacity to do that. They have an important role to, to play, but they are not our saviors. The private sector is an essential driver of, economic, uh, uh, driver of the economic engine of any nation, and therefore has to play the relevant and strategic role that takes into account the local environment from which it operates. The challenges the African continent faces are too hard and too complex to be left to one player. So the private sector has to step in in a strong and a very meaningful way. We need to get social issues being discussed in board meetings as opposed to uh, making it an agenda for uh, those who are involved in, um, in development. On the philanthropic front, Africans are extremely generous people. Each person in this room can attest to sending their relative to school or looking after members of the extended family. However, we have to be more strategic and more structured in the way we give and the way we engage philanthropy. We can't wait until we retire and have uh, set aside money for uh, future generations or uh, to put into trusts. We have to give as we make the money. I would like to testify that our programs, when I look at some of the programs that are uh, some foundations are doing on the ground very effectively, Dajuma Foundation, uh, Dangote Foundation, they've been very effective uh, on the ground when institutions set aside differences they have with governments. Let me tell you, uh, I think I come from the most complicated government in the world, 
but we work with them. We find common ground. The synergies are multiplied when we partner, and especially when private companies come to the table. And I couldn't have emphasized that more. We have case studies where we have tried this, and we can bear witness. And there's some, some of you, during the next few days, will have an opportunity to talk about where some of these partnerships have really worked effectively. The last issue on the leadership. We all know that we need to take greater responsibilities for our problems by creating synergies that enable us to solve problems that seem greater than us. And yet, this is the very area where we have grave shortcomings on the continent. So how do we face the challenges? We should face, I think we should face the brutal facts about what is the type of leader that we are now and have the courage to define the type of leader that puts us in a position of serving. What I mean by that is being a leader who works tirelessly to find ways to transform a vision into clear goals and actions without expecting validation, accolades, and recognition. We need to put serving first. Now, a group of us got together a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago to do just that, to confront the brutal facts about ourselves and look at what are some of the things that prevent us from being effective and being leaders who are well positioned and geared to serve our communities. It was amazing what we came up with. Here are some of the brutal facts we realized we had to confront. You know, it's always easier to look at the government and think they are the worst leaders that we've ever had. But when we brutally look at ourselves, I think it gives us a much easier uh, way to confront issues. Things that came up where we don't want to tell each other the truth and are overly diplomatic. We overestimate our capability, a false sense of security or being better. That sometimes we have a delusion of excellence and what excellence is. Many times we don't take counsel or advice because we know it all. Many times we cling to power. So I'm counting my tenor as chair of APF. When it's time to go, I will go. <laughs> We don't take responsibility or are uh, accountable for the actions we take. And sometimes we just overreact negatively when we make mistakes. The list could go on and on. So I want to encourage each of us to go through in this conference, to go through, to, to see this as a safe space where we can face the brutal facts and be able to engage in a deep and meaningful way so that we can really come up with solutions that are effective and solutions that really work. This is not a one-day matter, let me say. And this is neither something that we can start and finish within a workshop. Instead, let this be the start of a journey which will lead us as philanthropists to become more humble as leaders and to be more committed, especially in a financial sense, to bringing real change to our continent. As the African Philanthropy Network, we also recognize the critical role of networking. That's why we're here. We need to know each other and create a platform that allows us to share solutions, ideas, and amplify our voices. Because all of us in the room are blessed to be people of influence and with voices that can be heard in different spheres of society. And also we have convening uh, power. So I'll ask you this morning, to sit back and keep at the back of your mind just two things. How can you actively be part of this uh, public-private uh, sector partnership? And how can you, or how can we face the brutal facts as we look uh, at African philanthropy in a changing global context? With those few words, I would like to uh, introduce uh, to you the next speaker, who is Jane Wales. Uh, who will be uh, doing the next session and will also share a few words. And as, as I said before, Jane is the founder of the Global Philanthropy Forum. Thank you very much. I, I'm really here to say congratulations. Congratulations to everyone in the room, to Mosun, to Sitsi, to uh, the full board um, for their extraordinary leadership uh, and ability to make this happen. Um, so I, I'm coming here from Arizona, which is not normally where I'm coming from. I was spoke, speaking at a conference there, and a woman came up to me and said, well, if you're leaving, are you going home uh, to San Francisco? 
And I said, no, I'm going to Lagos, I'm going to Nigeria. And she said, oh my gosh, is that a, is that a beautiful spot? Um, well, is that where uh, Thalakuti uh, sang? Is, is, that, is that where Adichie wrote from? Uh, is, is that the Nigeria that uh, this conference is about? And, and my response was, well, it's about Nigeria, but it's not only about Nigeria. It's about Africa. And so when I answer the question of what is it like I have to find a word that covers every country, every culture of the African continent. And that was easy. The word is generosity. And it's that combination of generosity <clears throat> and strategy. It's the combination of generosity and strategy that the uh, African Philanthropy Forum is betting upon. And it's a pretty good bet. <laughs> and seeing all the folks that are in the room is a reminder of that. Um, it's especially fun for me to be here um, because I see all these dear friends that I've known over the years. And it's so wonderful to travel this far uh, and feel so much at home. Uh, Titi, of course, that's Toyan, uh, Saraki, Queen Sylvia, Maima Belasaji is here, uh, Zuera from, from Dangote, Mamadou, Muihaki, who were bet, made a bet on us early, as did Innocent of, of Ford Foundation, and Moki, and, and Chinwe. Um, each of you has played a role along the way uh, in guiding, inspiring, reinforcing the efforts of the leaders that, um, that are leading the APF today. So I want to thank you so much. Um, I think all I should add is that this is, uh, this is a continent of tremendous riches, of tremendous brain power, and of tremendous social capital, and that may be the most important aspect. But it's also uh, a, a continent with need, and that's a combination of the opportunity and the need that makes this so compelling. Now, most of you know what the Global Philanthropy Forum is, so I won't dwell on it. It's a, it's just a, it's a learning network of philanthropists who are committed to international causes. And the most important aspect of this network uh, are those in this room, individuals have chosen to invest, to give, to volunteer, uh, in the place where they made their careers, uh, made their wealth. Um, and that decision uh, couldn't, couldn't be more important. Um, a network is valuable only if it's growing, and Didi will tell you that, um, the, the ultimate networker. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons that we're so pleased and proud of APF. Having said that, um, everybody in this room is invited to the GPF as well, by virtue of your having been invited here. Um, we'd love to see you in April in Silicon Valley uh, in 2018. We'd love to see you in London. Uh, we're making it a little more convenient for some by having it in London in 2019. Um, but in the meantime, I think that everything you learn here, do here, bring from here, invent here, is probably the most important contribution that you can make. Uh, let me just say that I, I started this trip having made a mistake. Um, and that mistake was that when the woman asked me if I was going home, I said I was not. That's not true. I could not possibly feel more at home than I do today. So thank you. Thank you very much.